449. Let's see. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. The verse that we are going to be reading today is Psalms chapter 23, verse 1 through 4. Psalms chapter 23, verse 1 through 4. The Lord is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though thou I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. It's terrific to be here today. I bring you greetings from the brethren in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, I know that wherever I am, it's good to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. I recently heard about, I, I, I recently heard a devotional that a young man gave on the 23rd Psalm. And what he did when he gave his devotional essentially was he gave a retelling of the psalm in his own words. His retelling took maybe six or eight minutes, but the part that has stuck with me, the part that has haunted me, is when he talked about the valley and the shadow of death. You see, in his retelling, he didn't talk about it so much as a sheep to a shepherd as he did a sinner to a savior. Now, when he talked about the valley and the shadow of death, he put it this way. He said, my shepherd calls me to leave the valley and the shadow of death. He wants me to follow him. But I don't want to go. I like the valley and the shadow of death because it's fun. And as I listen to his words, it just sort of sent chills up and down my spine because it reminded me of just how closely we are tied to this world. Just how closely we are tied to our sins. You see, there is a reason why sin clings so tightly to us. It's because we cling so tightly to our sins, isn't it? This world can have a hold on us. And I know that Jesus calls us to leave the valley of the shadow of death, but often we hesitate. We hesitate. Because it's in the valley where our sins are. And we like those sins. Sins are fun. At least for a while. Sins are satisfying. 
at least for a time, so he hesitates. Now, I don't know what sins have you most closely entangled. I don't know which ones that you are clinging to, but you know what happened. Maybe your sin has to do with lust. Maybe there's that pretty co-worker down the hall and she doesn't have any idea how much of your day you spent thinking about her. And she doesn't know how many times you steal glances at her when she thinks you're not looking. And you say to yourself, well, it's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting her. She doesn't even know about it. And so you cling to your sin. Maybe your sin has to do with lying. You lie to the government about how much money you actually make. You lie to your teacher at school about how much of that paper you actually wrote versus how much you pulled off the internet. You lie to your spouse, you lie to your children, you lie to your parents, and you lie because it pays off. You lie because you get away with it and benefit from it. And so you cling tightly to that sin. Or maybe, maybe your sin has to do with covetousness. That if you really looked hard at your life, you'd realize just how many of your decisions are focused on acquiring that next shiny toy. How many of your decisions are based on getting that next gadget? that comes out, the one that just got updated. And you like those toys. You like those gadgets. And so you cling tightly to that sin. I don't know which sins you are clinging tightly to, but I do know this, that those sins are part of the valley of the shadow of death. And until you listen to your Savior's call, you're not going to want to leave the battle. Let me read to you from John chapter 5. I'll be reading the first nine verses. You can open your Bibles there. John chapter 5 begins this way. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. And in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. I'm going, uh, when I'm trying to get there, another one steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed. And he took up his bed and walked. Chapter 5 opens here with the with Jesus and his disciples in Jerusalem. And it's feast time, John tells us. Now, Jerusalem was always a crowded place. But it was always more crowded at feast time, and at such times it was always more crowded in and around the temple. If you ever read the Gospels, at the time when Jesus is in Jerusalem, it seems that he's always heading to the temple or heading away from the temple, and so it was here. This colonnade was near the temple, and Jesus and his disciples seem to be heading away from the temple, going through this area that's called Bethesda. Now, Bethesda it has a name to it. The, the, uh, the word Beth, if you ever see it in your Bibles referring to a place name, Beth means house of. And so Bethel means house of God. Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethesda means house of grace house of mercy. And it's an appropriate name for this place because at this place 
there are pools. And at certain times, God stirs up the water in the pool. And the people believed that the first person who got into the water when the water was stirred up like that would be healed from whatever disease troubled him. So who gathered? Well, John tells us the blind, lame, paralyzed all gathered there. Probably others as well. The deaf, the arthritic, people with digestive problems. All kinds of people would gather there hoping that when the water was served, they would be the first one in the water and they would be cured of what ailed them. And so as we read in John 5, Jesus and his disciples are coming through the crowd here. You can imagine that they're probably elbowing their way through the crowd as the way you have to do when there are all kinds of people involved. And for some reason, Jesus focuses on this paralyzed man by the pool. This man there has been paralyzed for 38 years. As I look around here this morning, I see a number of you who are not yet 38 years old. 38 years is a long time. He's been waiting there every day, hoping to get into that pool to be cured, but it has not happened yet. And so as Jesus is walking by, he sees and he focuses on him. The man apparently doesn't recognize Jesus. It's not as if he says, you know, waves his arm and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. That happened from time to time. But not today. Today, Jesus sees this man, and he comes to him, and in verse 6 it says, he comes to him and realizes he's been there a very long time and asks him, do you want to be healed? Strange question. Do you want to be healed? man gives Jesus what's really sort of a long convoluted answer. It went something like this. He said, every day I come to this pool. Every day I come here hoping that this will be one of those days when the waters are stirred. And it doesn't happen often. But sometimes it happens. And waiting here on the off chance that it's going to happen, I'm desperate to be healed. But you see, my problem isn't my eyesight. My problem isn't my hearing. My problem is my mobility. And so when the waters are stirred, I try so hard to get into that water. But somebody always gets in for me. And yet, I come back day after day because I am desperate to be healed. Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And he could have just given a simple yes. But instead he answers Jesus in such a way that he opens his heart to him and says, I want to be healed so badly I can taste it. Do you want to be healed? Is the question. It almost is an impertinent question when you think of a man who is so desperate. But it's a question that had to be asked. And it's a question that Jesus asks us today. And it's a question that we need to ask ourselves as well. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was a man who had two sons. Now, this man was a successful businessman. He had lots of money. He had real estate. He had holdings. And he had stipulated in his will that when he died, his estate, all of his prosperity would be divided between his two sons. And for his older son, that was great. But for his younger son, that wasn't good enough. Because his younger son thought, it's going to be a long time before my dad dies. 
And I don't want to be one of those middle-aged guys who finally comes into some money. I want to have my money while I can spend it. I want to live while living is good. I want to experience life. And so he goes to his father and says, Father, give me my share of the estate. That broke his father's heart. He said, son, why would you want Everything you could possibly need in your life is right here. Why do you want this money? But you know, you don't treat grown children the same way you treat growing children. So he did what his son wanted. He cut him a check, and his son, without so much as a goodbye, headed off to the bank. He cashed the check, he packed two suitcases. One for his clothes, one for his money, and he headed off to the airport. The oldest son heard about this. As quick as he could, he called him. He, he called his brother and said, Brother, don't you want to come back home? His brother said, Home? I'm hardly out the door. I'll tell you what I'm doing, though. I'm on my way to Vegas. I'm going to go there and experience everything I've never been allowed to experience at home. I'm going to go there and live it up. So don't call me, because I'm going to have fun. And he hung up the phone and got on the plane. Some time passed. And the heart of that older brother just burned within him. And so he said, I have to call my brother. So he called him up and said, Brother, don't you want to come home now? <laughs> the younger brother laughed. And he said, Home? Oh, are you kidding me? If you knew what I was doing right now, you wouldn't even ask. I have a woman on an arm, and I have dice in my hand, and I'm on a hot streak. I am living the good life. This is why I left home. You should come out and try and live like this sometime. It's a good thing. Now I'm going to hang up because you're ruining my mojo. Don't call me back. Some time went by. And once again, the old brother just couldn't stand it anymore. He had to call his brother. He had to at least hear his voice. And he called him up and he said, Brother, are you ready to come home yet? And on the other end of the line, his brother snapped at him. He said, would you quit calling me and asking that question? And he hung up the phone. What he did not tell his brother was that life had taken a turn for the worse for him. He'd gone on a cold streak. He'd rolled double or nothing too many times. Now, instead of living in the ambassador suite, he was living in a janky hotel across town. Now, instead of having a fortune that he could spend, he had a very small amount that he had to manage, and he had to pinch his pennies. But he was convinced. He was convinced that if he could just get on a hot street, he could build it all back up, he could have his fortune back. And that was very important to him. Because, you see, when the lights were out, and the only lights we could see were the flashing neon lights across the street, he thought a lot about home. He thought a lot about what he had left behind, the love, the comfort. He thought a lot about going home, but he said to himself, I can't go home like this. If I can just win my money back, I can go home triumphant. But I can't go home like this. And when he closed his eyes at night, he was afraid. Some time went by, and once more the older brother called up his, his younger sibling, and he said, Brother, are you ready to come home now? And there was a brief moment of silence. The other end of the line. And then his brother said, I've been thinking a lot about that lately. He 
see, I've lost everything I have. In fact, right now I'm living on credit. I've got a job, but to be truthful, it's a crummy job. It barely pays the bills and the interest on the debt that I owe. But I hope one day I'll have saved enough money so that I can come home. And from the other end of the line, his brother said, that's all I've been waiting to hear. I want you home. And it's never been about the amount of money that you have. It's never been about the things that you've done. I just want you home. And so I'll, I'll send you the money for a ticket, or I'll, I'll come there and get you myself. But brother, I want you home, and I've just been waiting for you to tell me that you want to be here. As I hear the question that Jesus asks in John chapter 5, and as I hear the conversation of that older brother with the younger brother, I hear the same thing in the air. Do you want to come home? Do you want to get better? For Jesus, he's not asking the invalid there, the man who's paralyzed, he's not asking him, do you want to get better? In other words, do you want me and my disciples to hang around until the water's troubled and I can put you into the pool? He's asking him if he's ready to get better today, right now. That's that the older brother talk to the younger brother. He's not asking him, are you ready to pay for your ticket back? He's saying, are you ready to come back? Are you ready to get better? Are you ready to leave the valley of the shadow of death? That's really the question we all have to answer ourselves. That's what we have to answer to our Savior. Am I ready to get better? Am I ready to come home? Am I ready to leave the valley of the shadow of death? As we wrap up our time together this morning, there are a couple of things I want to do. In just a minute, I'm going to give you a moment of silence. And in that silence, if you choose, you may want to say a prayer to God. Maybe that prayer needs to be a prayer of confession. Maybe you need to pray to Him, God, I have sinned, I have reveled in the valley, I have clung tightly to my sins, and I need to give them up. Maybe that prayer needs to be a prayer of supplication. Maybe it needs to be God. I have tried giving up my sins, but I cling so tightly to them. But I want to come home. I want to get better. I want to leave the valley. Would you help me? Would you show me the way? Would you let me hold your hand? Maybe that prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. Where you say, God... I can see the valley of the shadow of death receding farther and farther behind me, and it's not because of me. It's because of your leading. Maybe you need to thank God for bringing you to the point farther out of that valley than you've ever been. Or maybe, maybe you just want to spend this time in silent contemplation thinking about where you are in this life, thinking if there are some changes that you and the Lord need to make together. However you want to spend this moment, spend a little time.
Now as you finish praying, there's one more thing I'd like to ask you to do. When you came in today, you got one of these announcement sheets. If you notice on the inside of that, on the notes section here, right at the bottom, it has a list of all the elders. It has a list of ministers. And beside that, it gives all of their phone numbers. Here's what I want you to do with that. I want you to take these and use them, put them in a place where you'll have access to them. Maybe you want to just fold it up and put it in your Bible and use it as a bookmark. Maybe you want to cut out that section and put it on the side of your refrigerator. Or maybe you want to put it in your cubicle at work. Wherever it is that you have it available to you. Maybe you want to make sure that all of these names and numbers are in your phone, in your wherever your directory is, that you can have them at a moment's notice. And then, I want you to use them. Because when you and I were baptized. When we came into the family of the Lord, we didn't come in as individual Christians. We came in as part of the family of God. We came in as a part of the body of Christ, as a part of the church. And we did that because Christ knew that we needed each other. And when we have Christ's that's when we need each other the most. And so it could be that tomorrow you're going to go through a crisis. You're going to go through some kind of a trial. You're going to go through some kind of a temptation. You're going to go through something in your life where you really need another Christian in your life to help give you the balance, to help give you, help give you the strength that you need to get through your time of trial. Now, you may have somebody in your life that you call upon at such a time. You may have another brother or sister in Christ that you lean upon and that helps you get through those times. And if so, that's terrific. But I want you to have these names and numbers available to you. Because I can tell you that these people on that list are ready to help you. You call them up. If you say... Could I come over to your house and talk? Could I meet you for coffee someplace? Or could you just pray with me over the phone? The people on that list will be there for you. They'll pray for you. They will pray with you. And they will help beat your strength in your crisis. The elders, the ministers here... I can't say that they are the brother from that story I told you, the older brother, because they actually can't lead you out of the valley of the shadow of death. Only Jesus can do that. He is the one that's our shepherd. But I'll tell you what they can do. They can walk side by side with you out of the valley. They can join hands with you as you walk with Jesus out of that valley. Because they've been there too. And actually, we're all, as a church, walking out of the valley of the shadow of death. Do you remember what Bethesda means? House of grace. House of mercy. That's what this church is. That's what this congregation is. It is a house of grace. It's a house of mercy because we all are children of grace. We all stand in need of God's mercy. We are Bethesda. That could be today that you're not a Christian. It could be that you're not a part of that Bethesda because you have never accepted the grace of Christ. You have never confessed his name and put him on in baptism and had Jesus wash away your sins. But if that's the case today, I don't know why you wouldn't want to come, to give in your life, to accept that grace, 
and to begin your journey out of the valley of the shadow of death. If you'd like to do that today, or for any other reason, you want to talk to the congregation and tell them what's on your heart, then won't you come forward as we stand and sing?